Back to basics, we're going to start a whole new catalogue. Having done all the Messier objects, I have a new catalogue for us to make a whole bunch more Deep Sky videos of. We're not doing NGC, are we? Not, no, the NGC, there's rather too many objects in the NGC. The catalogue I want to talk about actually has exactly the same number of objects in it as the Messier catalogue. Probably not by accident. 110? Actually, it's 109 because maybe one of the Messier objects isn't really there. But uh, yeah, almost exactly the same number. It is the Caldwell catalogue. And I thought I'd talk about Caldwell 1, but I guess first of all we have to talk about what the Caldwell catalogue is. Well, let's start why, why it's called the Caldwell catalogue. Uh, it, it's called that because it was actually created by Patrick Moore, um, whose full name is Patrick Caldwell Moore. And the reason why it wasn't called the Moore catalogue is because M was already taken for Messier, and so he decided to use C for Caldwell for his catalogue. Patrick Moore is kind of popularizer of astronomy, died a number of years ago now, presented a very long running programme on the BBC called The Sky at Night. Now the Pleiades is a good example of a fairly close-knit galactic or loose cluster. It's kind of everyone's idea of what an astronomer is in the UK. He was, he was in Deep Sky videos very briefly. He did, he did a one on Messier 40, I believe. M40, look for it, where is it? You won't find it, it's not there. Is he a good person to put together such a catalogue? Is he, is he like a legit astronomer? Oh, absolutely, he's the kind of the classic amateur astronomer in that he, you know, for many, many years had his own observatory, went out and took pictures of the sky, made sketches of the sky. So I should say why he's the right person, which is that this particular catalogue is, they're basically things which are nice to look at. And so, and that's absolutely what amateur astronomers want to do, right? Look at the nice things in the sky. Um, it's a beauty pageant. It really is. And it's sort of the, the, the flip side of the Messier catalogue. So if you remember back in the, 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 the Messier catalogue, the reason why Charles Messier made this catalogue was because they were things he didn't want to look at, right? Because he was actually interested in finding comets and all the things that looked a bit kind of fuzzy and comet-like that weren't comets, he wanted to kind of get out of the way. So the Messier catalogue, bizarrely, is a catalogue of things not to look at. Right? The Caldwell catalogue is things which aren't in the Messier catalogue, but you do want to look at. Um, so they're things which are just nice to look at in the sky. So there's no crossover, they're not allowed to be in both catalogues? No, there are none, I believe it's the case, none are in both catalogues there. Are, it's, it's things which didn't make it into the Messier catalogue, but nonetheless you ought to be looking at. Yeah, I think we, you know, we should start with Caldwell 1, because you know, it's an easy place to start. So, and the other interesting thing about the Caldwell catalogue is it's arranged in a logical order, right? The Messier catalogue is just random where the different numbers are. Caldwell catalogue is actually arranged in order, starting with the thing which is furthest north and working its way south. So if you live in the Northern Hemisphere, you look at the low number Caldwell catalogue. And if you live in the Southern Hemisphere, you look at the high number Caldwell catalogue objects. Um, and so Caldwell 1 is basically almost at the North Celestial Pole. It's about four or five degrees off the Celestial Pole, which means that actually from here in the UK, it's visible all year round. It's one of these things called a circumpolar object. So it's actually always visible. And what is it? It is an open cluster. The thing that we spend so long staring at in the Messier catalogue we don't um, like open clusters, they're boring. But actually, every, every cluster has a story to tell, every object has a story to tell. And here, so here we go, here's a picture of it. So this is my picture, taken from my back garden. Oh, you took this? Yes, one of mine. So it hasn't got a Messier number, it's obviously not a Messier object. Nope. It was discovered by uh, John Herschel, I think, son of William Herschel, uh, sometime in the 19th century. And yeah, it's just one of these ones, it didn't make its way into the Messier catalogue. It could have done, it just Messier happened not to look in that part of the sky, I suspect. Because he would have seen it, right? Yeah, it's, it, you know, as you can see it with a little telescope from my back garden in the middle of Nottingham, so it's not a particularly challenging object. It's a bit further away than quite a lot of open clusters. It's about 5,000 light years away, so relatively distant. But it does have some inter interesting features. It is old. Right? It's very unusual. So I don't know if you remember, there are these two types of cluster, the, the globular clusters, which are the kind of impressive round spherical ones, very, you know, generally with very, very many stars. And then there are the open clusters, which tend to be kind of more ragged in appearance. Fewer number of stars, not so well bound together. Globular clusters are all very old and have been around, you know, almost as long as the universe has been around. The open clusters tend to be much younger. They tend not to last very long because they're not terribly tightly bound together. They're the smaller collection of stars. So over time, stars just escape and they just get sort of torn to pieces. And so the stars spread out around the galaxy. What's interesting about Cold World One is it's old as well as being an open cluster. So it's one of these ones that kind of didn't form at the very beginning of the, the formation of the Milky Way, but it is about 8 billion years old. 
And so that's quite old for a, an open cluster. It's unusual for one to be that old. Because normally by eight, what, by eight billion years, you would have just completely dispersed. Exactly, they just have spread out. And in fact, you know, most of the stars we see around us that aren't in clusters will have been born in one of these open clusters. And over time, they just kind of get smeared around the galaxy overall. Possibly the sun. Almost certainly. I think probably almost all stars formed in a cluster of some size. You know, it might have been quite a small cluster, but they all formed in these clusters. Stars don't form individually, they form in groups. What's held this one together? Why has it stood the test of time? So I think there are a couple of reasons. Firstly, uh, it's quite massive. So actually, you know, it, it, it was quite well held together by its own gravity. Secondly, it formed quite a long way out in the Milky Way. That means that it didn't keep running into other things as it was kind of orbiting around the Milky Way. You know, if you're, if you're formed relatively close to the centre of the Milky Way, you're going to keep, there are, there are spiral arms and there are other clusters and everything's a bit crowded and therefore you're more likely to kind of end up gravitationally interacting with the kind of things which rip clusters apart. This one formed a relatively long way out, which meant it probably didn't encounter too much stuff. And it's also on an orbit which takes it quite a long way out of the plane of the Milky Way. And again, that means it spends a lot of its time away from most of the action in the plane of the Milky Way. It has to plunge through from time to time as it kind of orbits around, but most of the time it's away from where most of the things are that could rip it to bits. So it's just had a whole series of things in its favour in terms of it surviving that long, um, which is why it's still here eight billion years later. I would imagine this would make it quite a desirable target for astronomers, something that's stayed intact for so long. It's sort of interesting. I mean, it's an interesting laboratory for studying, for example, the studying stellar structure and star formation, or not star formation because it's quite old now, but, you know, how stars have evolved because... It's that, you know, it's that middling age, you know, you've got your very old globular clusters, which are, what, 10, 12 billion years old. You've got your very young open clusters. This is kind of a middle-aged uh, collection of stars, all more or less the same age, but all middle-aged. And so it's sort of an interesting laboratory for studying from that point of view. The only thing that kind of counts against it a bit is it's quite a long way away. And so therefore it's that much harder to study in detail because it's quite a distance away. It's also known as NGC 188. It does have an NGC number as well. So you can count this as another of the NGC objects if you want as well. But I have just happened across a paper that came up on this archive of preprints of papers. Somebody has used the, you know, we talked about it before, this Gaia satellite, which is um, studying stars, uh, the positions of stars with exquisite accuracy. And one of the things that Gaia measures is it measures this thing called proper motion, which is the motion of the stars on the sky, because it's measuring their position so accurately it can come back a year later and see how far they've moved. And so one of the nice ways of identifying stars in a, an open cluster like this is that all the stars, because if you go back to the picture for just a second here, you know, you can see there's a cluster in the middle, but there's a whole load of other stars as well. Right? It's not just the stars, you know. And that presumably there are, even when you're quite close to the middle here, there are stars around there that have nothing at all to do with the cluster. They're in front of it, they're behind it, they're not associating with it. But the nice thing is that all the stars that actually are in the cluster will all be moving together. And so one of the ways you can identify which uh, stars are actually members of the cluster is by studying these proper motions, studying the motions of the stars. And all the ones that are moving together are almost certainly members of the cluster and ones that are just moving in random directions probably aren't. So they use data from Gaia to kind of really clean up that these are the stars which are actually in that open cluster and use that to study it in a much more kind of robust way of actually making sure that they really were just studying the stars that were members of that same group. Professor, surely these stars have their own motion within the cluster itself too though as they interact with each other but is that insignificant compared to their overall motion of the cluster as a whole? It's smaller, it's not insignificant and in fact there's information in that too right? because you also you can study the motions of the stars within the cluster um, and that tells you stuff about, for example, what the mass of the cluster is. So you can use the motions to figure out what the mass of the cluster is. But it's like, you know, it's like you've got a, a swarm of bees that are kind of all buzzing around doing their own thing within the swarm, but the whole swarm is moving off in a particular direction. And so you can, you know, and the dominant effect is that overall motion. So you can use that to identify the, the cluster. When it comes to stars in the Milky Way and the stars you're talking about here, as in the stars that are part of the cluster and the stars that are in the foreground or background. Is that the only way we can differentiate? Can we use redshift or can we use the chemical composition of the stars? So, well, the, the, I mean, the redshift is basically measuring the speed. So I, I talked about the motion that way, but of course there's also motion that way or that way. And again, you can use that to say, actually, all these stars are going to be moving with a common redshift or blue shift. And so you can use that as a further piece of information. And of course, the other beautiful thing that Gaia measures is it actually measures the 
the distances of the stars as well. It measures this thing called parallax, which you, again, go back and do a little bit of physics here. The, as the Earth goes around the sun, you end up looking at the stars from slightly different directions depending on where on its orbit you, the Earth is. And that makes the stars appear to wobble backwards and forwards as you view them from slightly different perspectives. And so you can actually use that effect to measure the distance to the stars. So we actually know the distances to these stars, which gives you another way of saying these are the ones that are probably in the cluster because they're the right distance away. The ones in the foreground probably aren't. The ones in the background probably aren't. So there's lots of kind of bits of information that all go together to, to figure out which things are members of the, of the cluster and which aren't. You probably, I mean, in principle, you could use things like the chemical composition as well, but that's probably something you want to measure in that you actually want to say, okay, do, do all the stars in this cluster have the same chem chemical composition or did some of them form out of more recycled material and therefore have more heavy elements in them? So rather than using that as something to actually identify cluster members, it's something that having identified the cluster members, you probably then want to measure. You told me at the start the Cold War catalogue was, you know, well, I use the term beauty pageant. You told me they would be more spectacular. I was expecting a, like some big pink nebula and a horse's head and all sorts of stuff. That That's... I wouldn't call that a complete and utter beauty. It's not, and there were good ones to come, so we should make some more. But because of the way they're ordered, they didn't start with the prettiest one, they just start with the one which is furthest north. Thanks for watching. Look, I don't know if we're going to do the whole Coldwell catalogue. Maybe we will. We'll have to have a talk about it. Of course, we've already done all 110 Messier objects. I hope you've seen that playlist. I'll link to it on screen and in the description. And if you'd like to see more objects covered here on Deep Sky Videos, well, one thing you could do is support us on Patreon, just like these people whose names you see on the screen. Of course, the best thing you can do is watch and share the videos, but a little bit of extra support on Patreon goes a long way.